Okay, let's continue with today's class. So, in the uh, last couple of classes, we have been looking at uh, the non-idealities with our sampling switch. In particular, we took the MOSFET implementation and we saw that when the switch is on, ideally this is supposed to be a short circuit, but uh, it has some finite on resistance. And with our implementations, this on resistance was a non-linear function of the input that uh, gave rise to distortion, right? And as a solution, we came up with this uh, gate bootstrap switch where we keep the gate to source voltage constant and uh, we keep it equal to VDD. This keep it equal to VDD. Okay. And we also saw that uh, this on resistance also results, I mean generates uh, noise and uh, the mean squared value of the sample noise, what was that? What is the mean squared value? It was kt by c. Okay. And what was its path spectral density? How was it? It was white and this is under the assumption that the RC time constant is much much smaller than the time for which which is on. Okay. And for a uh, reasonably good switch, this is this will be the case, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, now, this is the issues when the MOSFET is on. Now, it turns out even when the MOSFET is off, it is far from an ideal switch. Ideally, you expect that it should be an open circuit, but in practice, you will find that there is a small, I'll just say, off capacitance. This is not so critical. And I mean, uh, there are easy ways to tackle this. I'll give us an assignment for you to check out. But uh, not just that. So here we saw issues when the MOSFET is on. Here the issues with when the MOSFET is off. So even it is going from on to off, there are issues, and that is a bit more critical. So we'll discuss that. So let us say this is the MOSFET. And uh, this is the capacitor, let us say this is the input source. So, to turn it on, we will apply VDD here. Now, again, without going to a lot of details about MOSFET device operation, when the MOSFET is on, you know that there is some channel formed. And what does this channel charge depend on? Is it gate voltage or something else? Is it just the gate voltage or? No, this, is a, this is basically the gate channel, so it should depend on gate voltage, but is it just the gate voltage or something else? It is it should depend on VGS and remember that only if VGS is greater than the threshold, channel is formed. So what will it depend on? VGS minus VTH, right? So uh, this to a first order, you can say it is proportional to VGS minus VTH, but in uh, actual, I mean practice, this is a terribly non-linear function of this gate over drive okay. and in our case what is the uh, VGS in this case VDD minus V in right. So this is a non-linear function of V in okay and now let us say I mean uh, this V in is a constant signal for now does not change and capacitor also nicely sample V in no issues as of now there is no issues. Now let us say the MOSFET is turned off. Now when the MOSFET is off, what can you say about the channel charge? It will be 0. So when it was on, we had some charge. When it is off, the channel has, I mean the charge has gone. So where did the charge go? I mean here the ch charge was there in the channel, right? Till the MOSFET was on, it was there. Yeah, I mean this charge has to go somewhere. It can go either here or here. We do not know what fraction of the charge will go in what direction, but at least it is clear that at least some part of this channel charge can actually get deposited onto the capacitor, right? Is that fine? I mean simply because from uh, for this charge there are two paths, you can either take this path or this path, right? And uh, ideally what should the, what do you want the, uh, want the uh, charge stored in the sampling capacitor to be, what do you want this to be? 
Vin is the voltage. What is the charge? C Vin, right? But now this additional channel charge will also get deposited. Of course, let's say the entire charge won't go there, but let's say a fraction of it, say some alpha times this channel charge, goes on to that. So it will get added here. And this channel charge, you know, is a nonlinear function of the input. So the voltage, the final sample, is basically the charge by the capacitance value. So it's V in plus this nonlinear function of the input by the capacitance. So this straight array will add distortion. Digital circuits, digital circuits you're not worried about linearity, isn't it? Digital circuit you just want to distinguish two uh, voltages, whether it's greater than something or less than something. That's all you want. In analog, we are more worried about linearity. Okay. So uh, this remember that uh, this has nothing to do with the fact that the signal is varying or non-varying. Here I we can consider the signal is constant. Even then, the because of the fact that the channel charge is a nonlinear function of the input. We have non-linearity in the samples. Okay, so this uh, issue is called charge injection. Make some space here. Yeah, I mean, let's say this is the final sample. Right? These are the samples. This is the voltage across capacitor. V out of n is the voltage across the capacitor sampled at the end of the sampling phase. Fine. No, I mean now the input changes in the next cycle, this will again be different, isn't it? I mean right now it is this V in plus some non a function of V in. Let's say in the next sample the V in changes, this added term will also change. Okay. Now strictly speaking, uh, this charge injection as such is not a problem. The problem is because the injected charge is non-linear function of the input, right? So if this was not a function of the input, we will just have some V in plus some constant offset, right? So irrespective of the input, the added extra charge or the extra voltage will be constant. That's majorly not an issue because as, in, as we saw in the last class, we usually have this differential structure where the signal of interest is the difference between these two voltages. Now if we use same switches in these two and if the charge injection is signal independent, we will have the same offset added in the two. If you take the difference, offset will get cancelled. The problem is because the channel charge is signal dependent. Okay, so this is the problem: signal dependent channel charge. I will say signal dependent charge injection. Okay, Great. and uh, please note that uh, here again this dependency on V in comes because our gate to source voltage is also varying with V in. If you were to use a gate bootstrap switch, what can you say about PGS? Huh? VGS is constant, we were trying to keep it to VDD. That's what we saw in the last class, right? So in that case, VGS will be a constant. Okay. So the dependence will not be so much, but still the substrate will be grounded usually for the NMOS, right? So the source to bulk voltage, what will it be? V in, approximately V in, right? And when the source to bulk voltage changes, what will change? Threshold will change. So now here the threshold will be a nonlinear function of the input. You can make this guy to be constant, but you still have some dependence on the input through threshold voltage. So this might still be a problem there. But this will be even more pronounced if you use a normal MOSFET switch like this. Because there you will have dependence on both VGS and VTH. Okay? Yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, that we cannot say. I mean, unless you know what is alpha, what is this F, we can't say. I mean, we can sit and calculate, but that's not the point here. We know th the point is to note that this is a problem and we'll try to find a solution for it. That's all. We don't need to analyze what you know effect this problem has. So great. And let's look at the solution for this now. So let me redraw the case here. So 
So the main problem is because when we turn off this switch, let's say call this transistor M1. When we turn off M1, the charge in the channel has two parts to go, right? If we somehow make sure that the there is no path for the charge to go to the right, then we are safe. And for that, what we'll do is before turning off the switch M1, we'll make the right side open. Instead of downing the capacitor, we'll open the bottom plate of the capacitor. So now looking to the right, you see an open circuit ideally. Right? So obviously charges cannot go there. So all the charges will actually go towards the source side and will be safe. Okay, that's the basic idea. So what we have to do is this. So this is V in. This is the main switch M1. Let us say it is clocked at a clock 5. I will draw the capacitor like this horizontally. So normally we were grounding this all the time. But now what we are saying is we will not ground it all the time. Before turning off the switch, we will open this. So what should I put here? I will put one more switch. And the idea is I will open this much earlier than this guy. Okay. And what kind of switch can I use here? PMOS or NMOS? It is connected to ground. So I can use an NMOS switch nicely. So let me label this M2. So the idea is we will open the switch early, so I will label this phi e. So the clocks ideally should look like this. Let us say this is the main clock phi. So in principle I just want the early clock to turn off before like this. Capacitor will have charge to be in, right? We'll, uh, yeah. Okay, but uh, instead of generating a clock which does this, where only falling edge is kind of advanced, it is much easier to generate clocks which look like this. Okay. So this will call as phi e, and basically this phi is a delayed version of phi e. That's all, right? So I'll take phi e and I can delay this using a couple of buffers and get phi. This is much easier to do. So the basic operation is this, first when we want to sample both M1 and M2 are on, right? And we will turn off M2 first and then we will turn off M1 later, okay? And when we turn off uh, M1 later, the channel charge of M1 will not get injected. That was the basic idea behind doing this. But now when we turn off M2 first, what about the channel charge of M2? It will go no, but you, you also have both sides, right? No, no, this, this path is always on. No, no, it is not like that, right? I mean, I, this, this, this switch is on, let us say. From here, uh, okay, and then capacitor is there and we are going to turn off this switch, right? So this channel charge, you cannot say that everything will go here. There can obviously be some portion that can go there. But is that a problem or no? I mean, what do you say, is charge injection a problem or what kind of charge injection is a problem? Sorry? If the charge depends on V in, it's a problem. So the channel charge of M2, do you think it depends on V in? What is the gate to source voltage of this? I mean, when the this is this guy is VDD when the switch is on. So what is the VGS? VDD. So it has no dependence on V in. So of course this will inject some charge, but that's okay because that is like a constant offset. In every clock cycle, irrespective of V in, the charge this second transistor M2 will inject will be the same. Okay. So that is not a main problem. So Q2 will inject something. How significant is this charge going in? Like, in terms of order? They are the same order? Which order? I mean, the one that goes. Q2 to V. Correct. Versus the extra charge, right? Uh -huh. 
the so that depends on what c you see it uh, it's not just the order right if you are looking at linearity performance of the order of 90 db this means you are looking at 10 power 9 9 orders of magnitude lower right so it becomes critical in these cases yeah so this channel charge of m2 will get injected but it's okay i'll just put this is not signal dependent okay great and uh, this technique is called bottom plate sampling and the reason is uh, so let's say you look at these two clocks and tell me uh, at what time instant the signal is getting sampled on the capacitor c this is the sampling capacitor c at what time instant the signal is getting sampled on the capacitor huh? both of them are on it is tracking but at what point it is sampled sampling means the capacitor value is frozen at that point ah, just when m2 is turned off is when it is sampled right because the moment m2 is off the capacitor can no longer track the input it is this time instant at which the voltage across capacitor is frozen okay so now these are the falling edges of phi e are the sampling instants so this mark these are sampling instants okay great and in principle this works nicely uh, but there could be a minor catch so let's look at that This is phi phi and let me draw the clocks quickly. Okay. Now let us say we turned off M2, this is M1, M2. Ideally we expect that it is an open circuit but in the beginning of the class I mentioned when a transistor is off, it is not a pure open circuit, you have a small off capacitor. So basically now we are operating in this time point where M2 is off but M1 is still on. Okay. So I will just say M2 off. So our earlier hypothesis was based on the assumption that looking to the right was complete open so none of the charges will go. But now you see that there is a path for the charges to flow. But of course uh, the impedance offered by this path will be really large because of capacitance is usually small but still there could be some charge going okay so let's see what can be done for that and again let's say uh, this is the channel charge qch1 let us say a small fraction beta times qch1 gets injected now let us say this is the polarity i'm marking ideally what was the capacitor charge c in the polarity no ideally in this polarity what is the charge stored in the capacitor? C into V in is what is what you wanted. But now this additional charge beta Q C H1 is getting added. Right? And these two capacitors are in series. So what can you say about this additional charge stored? No, no, I mean two capacitors are in series. If you are injecting some charge, same charge. I mean current flows, it's like basically current, right? So the additional uh, charge will be directly this beta times QCH1 for C. Similarly for C of in this polarity, what is the charge? Beta. Only beta QCH1, okay, fine. So that is why if you now try to take the voltage across the capacitor C, this is basically the charge by C. So, you can directly see that this will have this charge injection issue. But now uh, look at these two expressions and tell me uh, what is the operation that you will have to do to cancel the effect of charge injection. You have to subtract the two, right? So, I will have to either do let us say QC minus QC off.
or this if i do either of these two this guy will get cancelled okay so okay that begs a question how do you uh, add or subtract charges so let's take a quick detour so say you have two capacitors uh, say it's c1 c2 initially charged with q1 and q2 how will you add the charges in the, in the two capacitors i mean how, basically i want to add the two charges what is the simplest operation you can do you connect them in parallel i mean this is same as we have two current sources i want to add the two currents what do you do you put in parallel and this current is sum of the two currents i mean current is basically the rate of flow of charge right so whatever you think of for current the same holds for charge so if i do this the total charge at this node is basically sum of the charges on these two plates q1 plus q2 now in addition if i ground these two guys and if i look at uh, this voltage x this voltage will be the total charge by the total capacitance at that node c1 plus c2 fine but uh, now we want to subtract charges so let's say i'll take the same case i have two capacitors so this is q1 this is charged with q2 so how can i subtract the two charges i'll switch the polarity okay and remember that see if the this this plate is charged with plus q1 the charge here will be minus q1 here it is minus q2 right so in principle i just have to do this then basically the charges on these two plates get added okay so now the charge stored here is q1 minus q2 fine now again uh, like before if i basically ground these two times i mean these two terminals the total voltage at this node say y, y so vy will be the total charge by the total capacitance this okay so okay so now we know this so let's look at uh, our case probably i'll take it to the next page ah. so let me mark capacitor charges so here it is plus qc here it is plus qc of and what is the charge here in the other plate it's minus qc so what is the simplest thing i can do to subtract the charges i mean here i already have this plate charged to minus qc this plate charged to plus qc of so basically if i look at the total charge here that is subtraction of the two charges so uh, which of the two operations is easy to do this one or this one first one or second one second one is easy to do and that that inherently happens in the circuit okay so and just like before i will basically try to ground this guy and look at vx so first of all what is qx qx is qc of minus qc this is basically what is this minus cv okay and the moment i ground the left plate of capacitor to ground the total voltage vx is what in terms of the charge what is it by right? c plus c of fine i mean basically the total capacitance at this node is the parallel combination of c and c of that's all so this is in turn equal to minus cv in by c plus c of this i mean off capacitance is really small so this is as good as minus v sorry ah okay because this plate has negative right so i mean this is fine right you get qc qc of minus qc the charge in capacitor c was cv in plus beta ch1 you subtract the two you actually get negative i 
I mean, okay, when remember that when uh, the signal was getting sampled, C of was not there. I mean, C of is basically the capacitance when the switch is off, right? See, when you, when the signal was getting sampled, both the switches were on. So it was like a short. So this guy was completely sampling the input, and now when we turn the switch off, we say that there is a small capacitor here. No, I mean this is basically holding it. Okay, is this uh, idea clear? So the let me draw the complete circuit. So what we have to do is the following. This was our original circuit. Let's say this is M1, this is M2. We try to open the switch M2 earlier than M1, and then now we find that when the switch M2 is off, there could be a small off capacitor that can cause issues. So to tackle that, we are going to add one more switch here, connect it to ground, and look at the total voltage here. Okay, and if I call this X, the total charge is minus Cv in, and the total voltage is approximately minus. So, what kind of switch I can use for this guy? N MOS. So, this again is an N MOS. Great. So, what should be the clock phase controlling this switch? Phi e bar, phi bar. Okay, let's say call it phi x. So, let's say. Let us say phi e. Let us say phi. Okay. And let's say uh, you wanted phi phi bar or phi e bar. Phi e bar. Okay. And let us say when you do phi e bar, how will you generate phi e bar from phi e? Through an inverter. And remember that inverters will have some delay, right? So you will have something like this. We'll have some delay like this. So, because of that, what you can find is there is a small time for which both phi, phi e, sorry, this is phi e bar, right? There could be a small time for which phi e and phi e bar will be active. That's not something you want, right? This is simply because there will be a delay when you try to invert a signal through an inverter, okay? So, uh, because of that, there will be a small time instant for which both this switch and this switch will be on. That's not something you want, right? Same will happen if you try to invert phi and say I will use phi bar there. Okay. So, the point is you cannot have phi x to be directly phi bar or phi e bar. Okay. That's because when you do that, what happens is there is a possibility that the two clocks can be overlapped. And please note this clock phi x and phi, or for that factor, uh, fact phi e. These are two clock phases, and these are required to put the circuit in two different modes. When phi is active, we want to sample, and when phi x is active, we want to process the charge. You don't want to combine the two. So the fact is, when you have uh, two clocks like this, you never want them to be overlapping. That is, you never want the two clocks to be high at the same time. Is that okay? So the ideal way the clocks should be is like this. So let us say this is one clock. I'll call it phi one. I'll make sure that the second clock goes high only after this guy goes low. Okay. So there will be a small time for which both of them will be off. And similarly, this goes low. And after this goes low, this will trigger this to go high. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So this time period is still the clock period T S. This can be anything. I mean, I'm saying we need two clocks. Yeah. 
will come to that in principle if we have these clocks we are good how we'll generate them we'll see we'll see how we can generate them it is actually pretty easy to do and so what we'll do is i'll just show with ideal switches now this was m1 and m2 remember so i'll say this is clocked at 51 this is clocked at 51 early early version of 51 is easy right and this will be clocked at 52 and i look at the total voltage here so like he asked how do we generate the two clocks let's see and uh, by the way these are called non overlapping clocks for obvious reasons and in any switch capacitor circuit the main thing you have to ensure is that the clocks are never overlapping the moment it overlaps you are completely screwed okay this is something critical in any this kind of switch capacitor circuits so let's see how we can generate the clocks so say we are given the clock 5 master clock this is nice 50% duty cycle like this okay now what i want is to generate a clock 51 and 52 and of course when i generate uh, this clock 51 from pi I, I expect there will be some delay so let's say the pi 1 does something like this okay and i want uh, phi 2 to go active after this goes high right so let us say phi 2 does something like this so this is what i want to generate okay from the given clock phi which has 50 percent duty cycle so let's see how we can do probably yeah so we are given phi we want to get phi 1 phi 2 so let's look at phi 2 so phi 2 is going high after phi is low and phi 1 is low so essentially you need some kind of logic that gives you an output of 1 when both the inputs are 0 what kind of logic is that i mean simplest nor gate right so in principle you can generate phi 2 by ignoring what signals phi and phi 1 and phi right so let's say this is phi maybe phi is down phi 1 and remember that this point is when phi 1 goes slow and the nor gate will have some delay to make the output high this is uh, this is basically the delay right so this is the delay of the nor gate i'll say okay now similarly let's look at phi 1 yeah phi 1 is here or maybe what can i put yeah let's say i show phi 1 here again let's look at phi 1 here so phi 1 is going high when basically phi 2 is gone low and phi is high and i can think of the phi signal being high as phi bar being low so i'll draw phi bar like this i'll draw here itself okay and as expected phi bar will come after a small delay so there will be a overlap that's okay so but the point i'm getting at is you make phi 1 high when phi bar is low and phi 2 is low so how can you generate phi 1 i'll put one more nor and this time i will be noring phi bar and phi 2 okay because remember after phi 2 goes low is when you make this high is that okay so this color is phi bar so if i have phi bar i'll connect this this looks like an sr latch but we are not operating as a complete latch because we have a case where both signals are zero for something right yeah so now of course you have to generate uh, this is phi bar mind you you have to generate phi bar from phi so i'll put an inverter here and finish it okay. is that okay and remember that the time for which we have this non-overlapping this is the delay of the nor gate 
So if you want to increase the overlap time, you basically have to increase the delay in this logic. So one simple thing you can do is to add uh, more delay there by intentionally putting buffers. So you can add more buffers here like this. Okay. And then do the connection. But sometimes, let's say you want to get more delay, like much larger delay, it's easier to intentionally add delays than. So now the non overlap time will be the entire delay of this guy. Is that okay? Great. Uh, so now we have seen how, I mean, now we kind of have hold of our sampling network. So we need to do the bottom plate sampling wherein we sample the signal from the bottom plate of the capacitor like this. And to process the final signal, we ground this guy and look at the total charge or the voltage there. And I will keep reminding this total charge is minus CV in and Vx is approximately minus V. Right? So now uh, we can process this uh, data. So let us say phi 2 psi, that is when I will be processing the sample data. This is what we have. And this signal you can directly process it. But remember that the moment I draw any current from this capacitor, what will happen? I mean, the, what is the role of the capacitor here? It is basically sampling the sampling in, signal, right? Now, if I draw any current from this, what will happen to the sample? If the capacitor will lose its charge. So, Whenever you are processing, you need to make sure this current is zero, right? So ideally, you want to put a buffer and do it. And what is the simplest voltage buffer? You know, common drain, source follower like this. Okay. So in principle, you can do this. But of course, I mean, uh, this the moment you add this, this will add its own nonlinearities. So uh, not this is not very commonly done. So what is more? Often done is this. Let me probably copy this. Let me push this down. Yeah. So let me let's consider a case where we have a capacitor where this is charged to some voltage, say I don't know Vx or something. Okay, and uh, in this case, one of the terminals of the capacitor is grounded. But let us say in the example I am considering, both the terminals are free for you. Okay, now I want to process this capacitor voltage, but I want to make sure that. If I am drawing any current from here, the current should not come from the capacitor. Okay, that's what I want. I want to process the voltage across the capacitor, but not draw any current from the capacitor. So obviously, the current has to come from some some guy. So the entire current will go like this. Fine. This is what hypothetically you want. Okay, and let us say you want this voltage V out to be exactly equal to V x. What uh, what do you want this voltage to be? Zero. If that was zero, V out will be V x. Fine. But let's say directly connected to ground. What will happen now? We have uh, presented a close path for the charges to flow. We can no longer guarantee that we kept, you know, we are not drawing any current from the capacitor. There is an easy chance that charges might flow out of this. Okay, so basically this cannot be an actual ground. This has to be a ground, but a ground with a high impedance. So what ground is that? Virtual ground? Okay. So to implement virtual ground, what do you need? Yeah, let's say you guys know how to design op amps. So let's say we have an ideal op amp with this. Okay. So let me shoot here. So what you want to do is this. This is the capacitor. 
So this side must be at virtual ground. And how do we implement virtual ground using op amp? And this should be negative feedback, right? So one terminal is ground to this. Okay, this must be at virtual ground, so I connect it here, and this guy goes here. So okay. So now this is at zero, and that is enforced by the op amp due to the negative feedback we have. And since this is zero, this guy is equal to the voltage stored across capacitor V X. And if we were to draw any current here, that entire current will come from the op amp because this is basically open. No current can actually flow here. Okay, so this is what we have to do. But uh, unfortunately, in our case, the one terminal of the capacitor is actually grounded, so we can't directly do this. Okay. Uh, so what we can do is we can try to transfer the sampled charge in this capacitor to this capacitor. I mean, this this point okay. To do this, you need to access you need access to both terminals of the capacitor, right? But in our case, one terminal is grounded, so we can't directly do this. So what I am suggesting is, why don't we try to transfer the capacitor's charge that we have sampled to this capacitor? Fine. And uh, let us say this is. Uh, Remember the capacitor has sampled V in here in this polarity. Okay. Now, if I want to transfer the complete charge of this capacitor, after the capacitor has transferred its entire charge, what will be the charge stored in it? Zero. So, if I want to make the charge in the capacitor zero, what should this voltage be? Let's say called Vy. If Vy is zero, it's fine. But again, if I directly connect it to ground. The capacitor is lose it, lose the charge to ground. So this should not again be a ground. What should it be? This will again be a virtual ground. So I have another virtual ground here. So I can connect the two. So basically, you do this. Okay. Then this one, phi two one, the switch is that is proper. Right? This is. This is proper. Grounded. This is ground. Yeah, this is ground. I mean, this is virtual ground. Okay. And let's say I call this sampling capacitor C and the floating capacitor C F. So let's see what happens. Oops. But is the logic clear? Okay. Great. So let me actually clear. Let's say this capacitor is CF, and again uh, remember that just when we finish sampling, after turning off both the switches, phi one and phi one e, the charge stored in node X or the total charge stored here is minus E V in. Okay, fine. But the moment I connect it like this, this voltage is what? That zero. Op amp and negative feedback will enforce it to zero, so the total charge stored in C will be what finally zero. But earlier this had a charge of minus C V in, right? So where did it go? It went to C F. That's what you also want. Okay. So the charge in this plate is minus C V in. So what will be the charge in the right side plate of C F? Plus C V in. So here it will be plus C V in. Okay. And let us say I call this guy V out. So what is the voltage across capacitor C F? Is it out here? Huh? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean that's V out, right? So what is the relation between the charge stored in the capacitor C F and its voltage? Okay. And this charge is basically C V in. Right? I'm just doing it in a roundabout way, but anyways, yeah. So finally, my V out is C by C F times V. Okay.
So again, this gives you uh, another advantage in the sense we can basically choose the value of C and CF appropriately to actually even amplify your sample data. Okay. And remember, this is the circuit in the phase phi 2. So let's draw the complete circuit. So our sampling network is still the same. We are doing this. I'll just say it 1 and 1e. Okay, not write 5. So this is grounded in 2. And we are connecting it to the virtual ground like this. And I'll also have to add another switch here to basically uh, reset this capacitor to ground. Okay, That's because if I don't do that, let's say I don't add the switch here, what will happen in the first clock cycle, the capacitor samples V in okay. and then it will transfer the charge to this guy. So the charge stored in the feedback capacitor CF is CV in. Now in the second clock cycle again you will be sampling V in, you will be transferring it to this guy. This already had a charge of CV in, it will get added. Okay. So we have to reset this capacitor every time. Because all you want is I want to sample the signal and only that sample has to be stored in the capacitor. All its previous memory has to be erased. Okay. So this is the complete circuit. And this is the simplest, I mean, or one of the variants of what is called switch capacitor amplifier. This is spelling capacitor. Okay. Why is it amplifier? You tell me. What is the output in terms of input? 